Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Cam Smith. Uh, I'm part of the AC Emerging Professionals Northwest Committee. So I'd just like to welcome you to the AC Emerging Professionals webinar. It's organized by the Northwest Group. So today we're going to focus on AC agreements. Um, my background is that I'm a structural engineer uh, and I've, I've struggled in the past with getting that sort of commercial experience. So I wanted to organize a webinar that could help others improve their commercial understanding. Um, and as I'm on the ACE committee, I thought an introduction to AC agreements would sort of be perfect for that. Now, this is just an introduction, I will say, uh, to the agreements. So it'll be more of a high level overview. Um, but if you're someone with a bit more experience, you know, hopefully it still serves as a, as a useful refresher course for you. Um, Today we've got for you Rosemary Beals of ACE and Robert Reed of Beale & Co. They'll be speaking for us today. And just so you know, at the end, there will be time for a Q&A session, hopefully. We're aiming for, for an hour or slightly less. Um, and I'll explain how you can send your question through on the next slide. So a bit of housekeeping for you. So repeat listeners, you'll know all about this, um, but it's good to remind everyone, especially if we've got some new listeners today. So it's best experienced through headphones, uh, just cut out some background noise. Um, to ask questions, so there should be uh, questions in your control panel on Zoom. Uh, so you can ask questions throughout the web webinar. Um, we're gonna tackle the questions at the end, um, but if you think of any as you go, it'd be really great to get some questions in um, and I'll sort of direct your questions at the end. Um, we'll try to answer as many as possible, sort of time permitting. Uh, and don't worry if you miss anything, because we're, we're currently recording um, and we'll be uploading this to our website in the next few days. Um, so if you want to listen again, uh, you can. OK, so what I'd like to do, first of all, is actually just do a bit of a poll. We've got two poll questions for you. Um, so the first one, hopefully it should have popped up on your screen um, somewhere. So the question is, how much experience do you have with AC agreements? I just want to kind of get an understanding of where other people are sort of at with their commercial understanding of the agreement. So a few options here. Um, do you have no experience with AC agreements? Do you sort of have a basic understanding, but perhaps like no actual experience in, in applying the agreements? Um, or do you have a basic understanding, but maybe you've used them on a project before? Um, and then finally, like a good understanding and, and, a, and you've had experience with them before. Um, if everyone can just tick, tick where you think you're at. Um, just be good to, to see sort of where we're at, sort of if we're kind of who we're targeting here with, with who's in here today. So sort of give that another 15 seconds or so. Um, just see, see where we're at. So again, it's no experience, basic understanding, but no experience, basic understanding, um, but maybe you've used the actual agreement on a, on a project. Uh, and then finally, you, you're an expert. So, um, I don't know if we're going to get the results. Oh, here we go. So uh, some, some good amount of votes there. Thank you very much. Um, so it kind of seems that a lot of us have, have no experience uh, and then quite a few of us a sort of basic understanding of, of the agreements, but perhaps, you know, maybe we have used them on a project. So, I mean, hopefully after today, we'll sort of have a little bit of a better understanding um, overall. So I think let's go into the speakers then. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Rosemary Beals, uh, Agreements Consultant at the AC, and she'll be starting us off. So over to you, Rosemary. I think you're on mute, Rosemary. <laughs> Rosemary, can you hear me? think you're on mute. Can you just unmute yourself maybe on Zoom or check now if you're able to do it? There Hi. we go. Hi. <laughs> All right, I'll head on okay, mute. Let's, let's start again. Um, the first question is why use a standard form of agreement, which the ACE agreement is? Um, the agreement, of course, delivered um, a framework for the delivery of services and the terms and conditions that um, govern their delivery. So the question really is, do you know what you're signing up to? And that's a fundamental question when entering into any form of consultancy agreement. 
whatever the value or the complexity of the services to be provided, the business case for clarity on the proper allocation of risk goes without saying. And working within a clear legal framework is certainly a part of this. And it's actually quite surprisingly common that people can't answer the question. So, so why is this the case? It's largely because they've never seen the terms and conditions of the agreement which underpin the services to be provided in which they've signed up to. They might have seen a reference in the terms and conditions, but they've not been included in any documentation. There may be some amendments or additional clauses to be included in the agreement, but they've nothing to relate them to. So they're pretty well in the dark, and that's not a good start to any ongoing relationship. So there's an overwhelming case for using standard terms of agreement that have been produced by industry and known and understood by users. The business case for clarity is irrefutable. So what is the ACE Professional Services Agreement? Could I have slide one, please? Uh, thank you. Um, the current suite of ACE agreements provide standard forms of appointment for consulting engineers and they are well known within the industry, though not universally used. Um, the use of standard forms of agreement is well recognized as being beneficial to the users who are able to work on terms and conditions which are understood, consistent, and generally insurable. ACE agreements in some form or other have been around for over a century, as the slide your uh, viewing illustrates. Um, and you can probably see that uh, it's evolved over the period of time and up until around about the turn of the century um, engineers fees were also included in the agreement something that uh, some engineers still mourn the passing of but when competition law became tighter ACE was obliged to remove fee scales from the agreements until 2017, the 2009 suite of ACE agreements was amended in 2011 to uh, accommodate certain requirements from the Construction Act. Um, the separate suite for Scotland were the current documents. In fact, uh, some people still use them. Um, however, a review of the earlier agreements took place over a couple of years before publication of the 2017 edition that's the current edition, with a vision to produce a suite of up-to-date and user-friendly standard ACE agreements, acceptable to and used by consultants, public and private sector clients and contractors. The new agreements were to be drafted to cover the whole of the UK, so there was no need for a separate set for Scotland, bar one for the certification of structural design, which is a specific matter of legislation in Scotland. The new agreements were to contain a fair balance of risk and be sufficiently flexible to accommodate industry requirements as they evolve. A start had been made actually in 2015 with the publication of the ACE short form agreement produced for the delivery of low cost or straightforward services. However, the first of the new agreements, really the main one, the ACE Professional Services Agreement, its associated subconsultancy agreements and new schedules of services were published in 2017. Consultants, lawyers, and importantly, insurers were all involved in the drafting. And the agreements now apply to the whole of the UK. They're written in clearer language and all the duties and obligations of the parties are collected together to ensure a greater clarity of risk and responsibility which is intended to be a fair balance as between the parties. There's provision for early warning in events that might impact on the project or delivery of the services. There's a clause that encourages collaboration between the parties. BIM is provided for in general terms, given the fact that BIM is evolving. There is a designated place where supplementary clauses, if needed, can be put in order to highlight that these exist. It's quite important to know if you're signing a standard agreement where any changes might be made and to be able to accommodate them in one place can identify them and allow people to evaluate how they actually apply. 
many of these uh, provisions were designed to support the aim of the government's construction strategy. There are also guidance notes included in the 2017 agreement to assist in the understanding of its use, but they're not legally binding, I should stress that. And there's also a standard form of collateral warranty included. Following their publication in 2017, further agreements were added in 2019. And these are the Advisory Investigatory and Other Services Agreement, which is designed for the appointment of consultants to undertake any type of services in the built and natural environment, except where the client appointing the consultant intends to appoint a contractor to construct or install permanent work designed by the consultant as part of the services. There's also a consumer agreement, and this is in the form of a model letter intended to be used by a client who is regarded in law as a consumer. And this is for the appointment of a consultant for either the whole or part of a project. Again, it's drafted in clear language and can be used in the whole of the UK. It accommodates UK consumer protection legislation. And then again, exclusively for Scotland, there is the Certification of Structural Design Agreement. So there's now a complete and up-to-date set of agreements. Now, what is the rationale for formality? As I've indicated at the start, it's essential to know your contracts. You've got to be aware of the spoke contract and avoid avoid incorporation by reference. Could I have the next slide, please? Incorporation by reference is essentially referring to a document such as an agreement in tender documentation, but not including it within those documents. The data is, is therefore incomplete can't pick up the whole package. And it's important to note that to allude to or incorporate standard terms by reference can only lead to the following. A misunderstanding of what has been agreed, the risk of unlimited liability, the potential of jeopardizing good working relationships and time wasting and potentially costly disputes. To avoid this, you should complete and sign an appropriate and up-to-date standard form of agreements at the outset. You should agree the scope of services within the agreement with the client and make clear what is included and the cost. You must consider the effect of any proposed amendments to the standard form and do ensure that the terms of any agreement or contract are clearly set out and that none are incorporated by reference as they will not appear within what you sign and you can't change it later. It's a small illustration, I had an inquiry recently actually where I was asked a question relating to jurisdiction. The documents had included reference to ACE Agreement 1, 2009. But agreement 1 wasn't included. And the problem was actually that there was an Agreement 1 for Scotland and one for the rest of the UK. The contract was for work in Scotland, but that in itself would not necessarily infer the jurisdiction of the Scottish court. Issues such as where the contract was signed would play a part. There was confusion, which could have been easily avoided if the agreement had been properly included as part of the contract documentation. And there's also the case I'd like to point you to of Malcolm Charles against Christian, 200, uh, 2014, which uh, effectively confirmed the judgment in an earlier 2010 case. And this held that just because one party believed there was no, <coughs> excuse me, no binding contract, there was no guarantee a court would take the same view. <coughs> if on the evidence a reasonable person would <coughs> excuse me, consider the parties to be in agreement in intending to create a binding contract, and there's sufficient certainty for the contract to be enforced and the court can conclude that the contract exists. <clears throat> and this was despite the lack of execution of the contract in this case. And the case highlights the need for the proper execution 
of the contracting terms which are both clear and unambiguous. <clears throat> When on occasion a client also wishes to engage a consultant at short notice, it's important to know and understand what the terms of the agreement are. And incorporating a standard form saves time when considering all the documentation. You may still have to consider the effects of any bespoke clause, which may form a part of the agreement. And this is not always simple, and care and advice does need to be taken if there's any concern, not least in relation to insurance. So I can turn now to risk and liability and items to be considered for an equitable apportionment of risk. Risk must be equitably apportioned and the ACE agreement seeks to apportion risk on the basis that it should sit with the party best placed to manage it. Clause five of the agreement states in terms, the consultant and the client shall work together to analyze and manage any risks which may occur during the delivery of the services and the potential outcomes of those risks, including any associated costs. So I have the next slide, please. <clears throat> now, the first issue to be aware of is fitness for purpose, which you may well have heard of. This should not be required and is generally not beneficial for either party as it is largely uninsurable. Clause 2.1 of the ACE agreement states that in providing the services, the consultant shall exercise the reasonable skill, care and diligence appropriate to a consultant qualified in the discipline engaged in the performance of such services for projects of a similar nature, size and complexity to the project. This is fair and insurable. We turn now to unlimited liability. There should be no unlimited liability in relation to delivery of services, nor liability for direct or indirect loss of profit or indirect or consequential damage. A limitation of liability clause is a provision within a contractual agreement that allocates liability between the parties. Basically, that is, who carries what risk? Managing this through financial caps is an essential part of risk management and provides certainty to both client and consultant. An existence of financial caps can protect the consultant and the client and ensure adequate insurance for more reasonable costs. Limits assist on consideration of risk and who is best able to manage the risk. A cap can apply to each and every claim, may apply on an aggregated basis, that is grouped together, according to the particular event that caused the loss of damage, or might apply as the total limit. In fact, just discussing limitation of liability with the client can provide the opportunity to identify and explore risk management issues and risk allocation on a project. It can lead to both parties being better informed and potential risks being better catered for in the scope of services. You should make clear to the client that the cost of cover for the agreed risks will be included in the fee and that it is in nobody's interest to pay for something most unlikely to arise and that a cap in such circumstances would be appropriate. Clause 10.1 of the agreement deals with limits of liability, which it states should be set out in part one of the schedule for the agreement. If this is not done, the agreement does provide for default position of the limit being 10 times the fee and therefore safeguarding the consultant if an amount is omitted in error. Clause 10 1 also ensures that neither party is liable for loss of profit or consequential damage. It further provides for the exclusion of liability for what are termed the accepted matters, namely asbestos, terrorism, and pollution and contamination. If liability is to be excluded in these circumstances or limited in some way, this must be set out again in Schedule 1. And if liability is excluded for any of the accepted matters, then the agreement states that they're outside the scope of the agreement and the consultant shall have no responsibility for advising or providing any services in connection with those matters. It should be also noted that um, it is within Schedule 1, paragraph 9, 
that the consultant sets down the length of the liability period, either six or 12 years after completion of the services or their termination in value. <clears throat> And it's come to joint liability. It's essential that if either or third parties are involved in a liability issue, that the consultant's liability should be limited to a just and equitable proportion of liability attributable to the consultant's breach. And this amount included as a part of the consultant's total aggregate liability under the agreement. And uh, clause 10.2 covers this matter. <clears throat> The turn now to, to no disclaimer of liability and the client should take some responsibility for data or information supplied by the client and there should be no blanket disclaimer by the client. Such disclaimer may reduce a consultant's rights as essential. And clause 3.2 deals with information supplied by the client and subject to the consultant using the skill and care I've referred to earlier. Um, the client acknowledges the consultant will rely on the accuracy, sufficiency and completeness of all information and data provided by the client and be promptly told of any inaccuracy. It's also important uh, that the client should pay for additional work. Um, it shouldn't be a deem to be included in a professional's fee. Even if a contractor has agreed to this when a consultant is engaged on the design and build contract, payment should be made for ordered variations unless due to a failure to deliver by or an error of the consultant. And when there is additional work ordered and or disruption to the delivery of the services, the agreement should outline the circumstances where such payment should be made. And that is dealt with in clause 8.2 of the ACE agreement. And there should be no imposition of absolute or strict obligation without appropriate qualification. So there should be no requirement for compliance with third party agreements without the client ensuring that only what is required from the professional under the agreement is covered. So there should be no strict obligations where matters are outside the agreement. Um, and such requirements are akin to fit. to do something, it must be done unless it's uh, impossible or illegal, as there is a contractual obligation to do so. Words such as having due regard to the brief or similar might assist, but there should be an appropriate qualification and advice should be taken on this. I turn now to collateral warranties. And, uh, if a collateral warranty is required, it should not confer a greater benefit on the beneficiary than is given to the client under the agreement. Indeed, similar rationale applies to parent company guarantees where there should be no greater liability imposed on the parent than on the subsidiary which has entered into the contract. The risk of not being back to back is significant with insurance implications also playing a part. There is, as I said, a standard form of collateral warranty now included in the 2017 agreement, which satisfies these requirements. And it can be used to provide um, a warranty to a tenant or purchaser, or with amendment, which is also included in the document, to a funder. Now, um, I'll just touch on insurance. Um, Clause 11 deals with insurances to be maintained by the consultant. And these are public liability and professional indemnity insurance. And therefore the amounts and length of time sufficient to cover the consultant's liabilities under the agreement or that they should be at commercially reasonable rates with all the usual exclusions, et cetera commonly included in such insurance at the time that it's taken out or renewed. And you're probably aware that the insurance market has hardened considerably over the last year or two, and many factors have been assessed as increasing risk, with some providers dropping out of the market and others charging either premium premiums. ACE has issued some guidance on the issue as availability and cost are currently a key concern for members. And PI insurance is a specialist area with a long tail of liabilities and uh, legacy risks. And uh, this is a critical concern. It's uh, 
the insurance carriers at the time that claims made that covers the offence, and events such as these rental strategies has raised substantial issues regarding quality of structures and the like. In order to source cover on usable terms and at a realistic level of premium, early engagement with your broker is essential. It's no good just seeking to renew cover, say, just 28 days before it's required. Start early and ensure the broker has a detailed understanding of your practice. And a key part of this is, as we discussed earlier, managing your liability and PI insurance under the agreement we enter into, which means know your contract, know and understand your risk, and to assist in this, use an ACE agreement. And in conclusion, not understanding what you've signed up to isn't new. Back in the 1830s, there was what was known as the Stanhope and Tyne Affair, and that this related to the building of a railway. And Robert Stevenson was the consulting engineer, and his fee for his three-year involvement in the building of the line was a thousand pounds, quite a lot in those days. As money was tight in the startup phase, he agreed to accept £1,000 worth of shares in what was an unincorporated company. He had no understanding that the whole deed in an unincorporated company would make him personally liable for a share of the company's losses. The company failed, and Stevenson became personally liable for a share of £250,000. And he later said, the history of Stanhope and Tyne ought to be, as it shall be, a lesson deeply stamped. And I think that's something you might like to think about in the context of today and what I have uh, touched on in the course of this talk. Thank you very much. I'd now like to hand over to Robert Reed from Beale and Co, who will be dealing with other issues, and I think also touching on some matters that I've already touched on. Thanks very much for that, uh, Rosemary. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm going to look at a couple of uh, other elements of the ACE uh, agreement, and then I'm going to move on to provide some um, ex real life examples uh, of uh, the consequences of uh, either inappropriate amendments to the AC agreement or using client pr proposed bespoke agreements. Um, so firstly, uh, a really important element of uh, an AC agreement is the schedule of uh, services. Uh, so these will set out the services that the, con that the consultant has agreed to provide under the terms of the agreement. And it's really important for two reasons, because Firstly, uh, if you are asked, it, 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 the, the schedule of services sets out what you have agreed to provide as the consultant in return for that fee. So therefore, if you're asked to do other things, additional services, then as long as you fo follow the process in the ACE agreement, then you should be entitled to an additional fee for that, from that, for that uh, from the client. And secondly, the schedule of services is important because is because if there's a claim down the line, if there's a, uh, for, for negligent design or otherwise, one of the things that will be looked at is, is what was included within the engineer's scope and was what, uh, what the claim about part of their responsibilities. Uh, now the ACE agreement uh, comes with um, uh, schedules of services, template schedules of services for use uh, of which there are four um, de depending on whether you're being appointed as a structural or civil engineer or alternatively a mechanical and electrical engineer, and also depending on whether you are the lead consultant on the project or not. Uh, these uh, schedules of services, they follow the ROBA plan of work, so they are set out in terms of the different stages that a construction project would follow, so going from preparation, briefing, and concept design right through to manufacturing, construction, and handover. Uh, I mean, the schedules of services are, they're drafted from the point of view of what are the services that an engineer would usually be expected to provide on a project. 
But of course, every project is different. And it may be that on a particular project, you will be expected to do more or less. And you should always ensure that whatever you're agreeing as the schedule of services fits what you are expecting to do on the project in return in return for that fee. Uh, the ACE uh, template schedule of services also accommodate BIM as well, if uh, BIM's being used on the project. Uh, can we move on to the next slide on payment, please, Chetna? Uh, so payment under an ACE agreement will usually be uh, in installments, uh, and there are different options uh, for um, how those instalments are calculated. Uh, and the schedule within the AC agreement should be completed appropriately, depending on which of those, those options has been agreed with the client. Uh, so it might be that payments been agreed uh, on a time basis. Uh, lucky you if it has. Uh, so that would payment would then be based on hourly rates actually worked uh, based on the amount of time that the consultant has spent on the project in the previous month. More commonly, what's agreed is what's called a lump sum fee. So in other words, a fixed total fee for the services that the consultants agree to provide in the schedule of services. And then that will be broken down into in installments uh, against stages of the project or against the time period, such as monthly installments. Uh, I mean, instead of um, a fixed fee, the other option is also that the, the total fee could be, for example, a percentage of, of the project cost, uh, but that's, that's less common these days. Uh, you also need to complete the schedule of the AC agreements um, in relation to what in order to clarify what costs and expenses are included within within your fee and what are not included uh, and uh, the basis on which those are payable. Uh, so also in relation to payments, the ACE agreement sets out a specific process which needs to be followed in relation to each payment instalment. Uh, now the provisions are designed to comply with the Construction Act. Uh, and that's really important and one of the benefits of using a, an AC agreement, because if you use another agreement where the payment provisions don't provide, don't comply with the Construction Act, the risk is that another piece of legislation called um, the Scheme for Construction Contracts will instead determine what uh, the payment provisions will be. So you end up with a situation where actually the payment provisions that will apply are different to those which are actually written in the contract. So you want to avoid that confusion by having uh, by having payment provisions which will comply with the Construction Act. And if you're using an ACE agreement, you know that you've got an agreement with payment provisions that will comply with the Act. Um, so to give you some examples of what payment provisions need to include in order to comply with the Construction Act, Construction Act, they need to include a due date, uh, a final date for payment, and a date by when any payless notice must be served. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about those now as we look at what the actual process that the AC agreement um, provides for in relation to each instalment. So the, pr the procedure is this. So the consultant will issue their payment notice each month uh, assuming that monthly installments apply, stating the amount that it considers to be due and how that's been calculated. So usually that will be a pre-agreed installment. And the date that the consultant issues that invoice will be what's called the due date. And then you also have what's called the final date for payment, which is under the AC agreement, is 28 days after that due date. And that's the date by which the payment must be made by the client. So you have, so you issue your invoice and then 28 days later is the deadline by which the client should make, client should make payment. However, a client can serve what's called a pay less notice up to seven days before that final date for payment. Uh, and in that they would say, actually, we're not gonna pay you that amount. We're gonna, we're gonna pay you this, we're gonna pay you less instead for, for reason X. Uh, so in order to, um, 
so in order for them to be justified in in paying you less obviously they'd have to have a reason for a genuine reason for doing so uh, such as what's called a counterclaim or a set off so for example that you haven't performed the services that that you're that you're claiming that you have performed or that for some other reason money is owed from you um to the client uh and, and it may be that you your dispute that that uh, that 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 pay less notice um but but otherwise um the, the client will be entitled to only pay that reduced amount as specified in the pay less notice providing that they've served it within the time frame uh so that's just some of the key issues that arise uh, that, that arise uh, in relation to um payments. So, uh, Chetna, if we can now move on to the next slide, um, which is just uh, an opportunity for, for me to give you some examples of what might go wrong if you don't use an AC agreement, if you use a bespoke agreement proposed by the client, or alternatively, if inappropriate amendments are made to an AC agreement. Um, so as Rosemary touched on earlier, uh, ACE agreements are, they're designed to be compliant with the common requirements of engineers PI insurance. Uh, so for, so, so one of those requirements that, an, that the consultancy appointment needs to comply with in order to be consistent with that insurance is that any obligations in relation to performance of the service, the, the consultant services must not require them to do more than exercise a specified standard of care. Um, which will usually be the reasonable skill and care of uh, of a structural engineer, for example. Uh, so an AC agreement will contain uh, a standard of care along those lines and will caveat other obligations in relation to the performance of the services, such as an obligation not to specify materials, uh, dangerous to health and safety, with reference to that specific standard of care. It won't contain uncaveated absolute obligations uh, in relation to the performance of services. Uh, and it also, as Rosemary mentioned, won't contain any fitness for purpose obligations, which would be an obligation requiring the consultant to ensure that their design is fit for the, the client's intended purpose, or an obligation to ensure that they perform the services to the satisfaction of the, of the employer uh, at its absolute uh, discretion because if you have a fitness for purpose obligation that's unlikely to be covered by your pi insurance and similarly an absolute obligation under the appointment not caveated uh, by the specified standard of care is also not likely to be covered by your pi insurance and i have seen an example where this has had an impact um, in practice for an architect client where they had entered into a form of consultancy appointment which did contain a fitness for purpose obligation uh, and on that particular project uh, there were defects in the property and allegations of negligent design and the insurers um, refused coverage in other words they said that because of the appointment terms you've included we as pi insurers won't cover you for any claim in relation to into this this project and so this architect client was potentially looking at having to um, defend uh, a one million pound claim which if they were unsuccessful they'd have to pay for for themselves fortunately they were able to successfully defend it in in, in the circumstances but it just shows you um, the importance of getting these things right because a claim at that level, if it's not covered by insurance, could quite easily put uh, a consultancy practice out of business. So, so that's why it's so important that, that, that we get these things right. Um, it, another example um, of uh, another example of where, where, where things can go wrong um, if you don't use uh, an ACE agreement. Um, would be uh, Rosemary mentioned earlier uh, that the AC agreement includes um, an exclusion of uh, indirect or consequential losses. So what that is is um, 
losses which wouldn't be usual, wouldn't usually occur as a result of the breach of the uh, of the of of the consultant. Um, so, where you do have such indirect consequential losses, they can they can be quite significant. Um, so, I worked on a project where there were defects. Uh, there were defects on the property again due to due to design issues and the developer had um, they'd arranged to let out this property when it was completed on an extremely favorable basis for whatever reason Signif with the rent significantly higher than the market rate and the consultant knew about this and because the appointment didn't contain an indirect or consequential loss exclusion they were able to claim that full extortionate level of rent Whereas otherwise there would have been an argument that they would only be able to claim claim market rent because the ex excess rent was would, would have been would have not ordinarily flowed uh, flowed from that breach. Uh, another um, another example uh, would be uh, in relation to um, which we haven't really we haven't, we haven't really looked at so far would be in relation to copyright. Um, and why it's really important that in your appointment, as, as the AC agreement provides for, that you have an appropriate copyright license in relation to your rights as an engineer in your design documents, uh, and that you're not uh, vesting those rights in the client. You're not giving away your rights. What you should be doing instead is giving the client a license for them to use your design documents for the particular purpose uh, for the particular purposes of their of their project, uh, and I've certainly seen an example where a consultant hadn't paid much attention to the fact that they were signing up to give away those rights uh, in a in a bespoke form of appointment, and that means obviously as an engineer that you can't use you don't have the rights to use that design on any other other projects. So instead, the user position would be a copyright license. So you grant to your client a right for them to use your design for the particular purposes of that project only, but otherwise you as the consultant retain ownership of your, of your rights over your design. Uh, and just finally, uh, I just wanted to touch briefly also on um, PI, PI insurance obliga obligations to maintain professional indemnity insurance and the importance of ensuring as the AC agreement does that that obligation um, is subject to the caveat that you'll agree to provide PI insurance at a particular level, maintain PI insurance at a particular level, as long as that insurance is available at commercially reasonable rates. Because um, uh, I did, did some work for an improved inspector client um, and um, one of the issues they'd come up on is that they'd signed up to an appointment uh, which said that they were under an obligation to maintain professional indemnity insurance at a certain level for 12 years and didn't really say anything more, which in of itself doesn't seem particularly, particularly um, harmful. But um, obviously in recent times, there was a stage obviously where for approved inspectors, it wasn't actually possible after all the Grenville cladding issues to maintain to obtain professional indemnity insurance at all. And even now, there's only, I think, one scheme for approved inspectors to actually be able to obtain professional indemnity insurance. Um, so technically, when this approved inspector client wasn't able to take out that, wasn't able to maintain that insurance because it simply wasn't available anymore, they were technically in breach of that appointment, but they wouldn't have been had they had a proviso in there saying that you only have to maintain this insurance if it's actually available at commercially reasonable reasonable rates. Um, so that's just to give you a flavour really of some of the issues that can come up if you don't use an, agree a, 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 an AC agreement uh, or if you try to amend it or use a bespoke client appointment without understanding the consequences of doing so. And some of those consequences can be quite significant uh, and potentially damaging uh, to, to, your, to your consultancy business. Um, so I would stress that it is, it is really important to, to, to use AC e agreements and uh, understand what you're doing with them as well. Um, 
so i hope i hope everybody's uh found that useful uh i'm gonna pass back now to to callum and i think we're gonna have a q a session yes thank you very much robert there's some fascinating examples there um before the q a i'm going to be annoying again i'm going to do another poll um so just a quick one just out of curiosity so hopefully there should be a poll appearing on your screen shortly um so this one i just want to know is there any area of the agreement that you would like to know a bit more about following today you know we might use this to sort of do a follow-up session or or just curious to see where people would like to know more so we've got payments liability schedule of services dispute resolution and, and bim is it, i think you can only vote for one but is there any any of those that people would like to sort of know a bit more about or expand their knowledge on um just give everyone 10 seconds or so just to answer that and then we'll jump into the q a straight away uh, we've got about about 10 minutes or so so hopefully we sh should be able to get through the questions i've seen some have come through the chat as well so we'll get to them so okay liability seems to be the big one i thought that might be the case um and dispute resolution as well so um we'll uh, we'll bear that in mind uh, and there may be a follow-up one um but let's let's get into some questions um we've got quite a few here actually we might not be able to get through them all but i'll do my best so first question um from henry are you saying we should we should not send out fee proposals where we state reference should be made to AC agreement X for terms and conditions unless we attach the document. Rosemary, are you able to answer that? Yes, I am. Uh, and the answer is that the document should be attached because that is the only way you can be absolutely sure what the terms and conditions that govern the um, services actually are. It's uh, it's as simple as that. And I know very well that incorporation by reference happens quite often, but it is still a dangerous thing to do and a very small extra cost given the implications if uh, there are disputes afterwards, what exactly governs the contract. Okay. I don't know if Robert wants to say anything. But, uh, I think you're on mute, Robert. But that looked like a, I have nothing to add. Yeah, no, I've got nothing to add. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, next one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from Jordan. This one's come through the chat. So I, I will jump back to the Q&A ones. But um, Jordan asks, what kind of opportunities should emerging professionals be looking out for within our respective design firms in order to ensure we are growing and applying our commercial awareness slash skills? I'll just touch on that before I hand over. I think I'm assuming you're talking, you know, quite specifically about obtaining chartership. And what I found helpful helpful for me was trying to get involved with bids, or if, if you can, sort of provide assistance to project managers. And remember, you don't need to be an expert, but try and read read the contract that you're under on one of your jobs and try and understand it. Uh, and then, you know, it might take a few times to sink in, but eventually, you might actually be able to then use that um, somewhere in the job, and that would be the kind of experience that you should try and aim for How about you guys do you have anything to add um not really it's a, it's a side thing really but i believe that very often if it's, even if a standard form is used that um this recommendment can be made and there's nothing wrong with that provided they're put in the right place but what a lot of people don't realize is when they make these bespoke amendments that they have a knock-on effect to other provisions in the standard form. They don't realize that they don't, they aren't freestanding as amendments necessarily. And um, it may sound a harsh thing to say, but there is a very good argument for saying that engineers should stick to engineering and lawyers should stick to the law. And they can talk together to see what is required, but ultimately get someone to draft any amendments that are necessary who actually knows what the implications of those amendments are. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Okay, next one. Uh, in terms of basis of fee, do you think fee as a lump sum based on X percentage of construction value is a strong legal basis for requesting additional fee upon construction costs increasing post signature of the contract? 
Who wants to take this one? Oh, should I take that one? Yeah, sure. Well, there's there's two. So there's there's two separate. Yeah, there's two. So either you um, you have a, a a fixed fee, uh, which won't vary uh, depending on the construction cost of the project, or you have a fee that's based on the percentage of the constru of the construction cost. And if your fee is based on three percent of of the construction cost. Uh, and the construction costs ends up being increased because there are various variations, then, you, th then your total fee will also sh go up by that amount. So there would be a very strong uh, legal basis for requesting uh, that, 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 that a commensurate is increased to your fee. Okay. Um, next one. Can we have an example of indirect loss exclusion clause? Rosemary or Robert? Um, well, it, I mean, it would simply be a clause saying that um, saying that the consultant uh, won't be liable for any indirect or, or consequential loss. It, it's a it's a dare I say it. It's a, probably a relatively simple clause to to to, to draft. But as as I made the point, uh, that type of you do ideally want to include a clause of of that nature because um, th those are the losses that are not the sort of the normal losses that you would expect. But the but the the unusual ones, which you may well be aware of, but could be quite can end up being quite significant. So it is good to get an exclusion of that of that nature into an appointment which the ac agreement already covers uh, right. if you can okay uh, next one where is the legal standing should a client state i will pay you when i have been paid a uh, typical statement when being employed by contracting companies um well it's uh, it's unlawful effectively uh, the Con Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act, as amended people term the Construction Act, um, makes it unlawful to have what's effectively called a pay when paid clause. Okay. Um, got a few more. Um, can the AC form of appointment be used for sustainability, consultancy and environmental engineering services? Um, the answer is yes, it could. You would be probably looking not at the um, 2017 agreement, but um, the 2019 agreement, which is advisory, investigatory, and other services. Okay. Um, one here. What's the one most important piece of advice you you would both give to people new to agreements? Who wants to kick off? Yeah one piece of advice read them i think <laughs> <laughs> I guess the problem is i think i touched on the fact that uh, sometimes uh, consulting engineers are asked to uh, tender for services in, within a very short period of time and um, having a standard form helps to um, alleviate the uh, problem of reading through terms and conditions, but it is time well spent because very often still there are bespoke conditions. If you don't understand what you're signing up to and you sign up to it, you can't say, I didn't know later on, you're stuck with it. So even if there is a short period of time, don't ignore the, um, the legal side. Uh, it could come back to bite you. <laughs> Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Read them, under, understand them, and apply them. Don't just sort of forget, put them in a drawer, and forget about them, um, because you know they're relevant. They're not just relevant in the event that the worst were to happen, and um, and something went wrong, and you're you're facing a claim. They're relevant, obviously, as we discussed, uh, in terms of what you're expected to do throughout the project. You know when you're entitled to ask for additional fees uh you know what the payment process you should be following is so you need to you need to sort of live them really as a, sort of part of your involvement in, in in the project 
Yeah, I might just add to that. Daryl, you probably don't want my advice, but um, if you can find an agreement that is actually on a job that you're working under, it just helps a lot to have context behind it rather than just reading a, a standard a, agreement template or something like that. Try and find one that, that's on a job that you're working on. The context really helps there. Um, probably this will probably be the last one just because of time. Um, so sorry if we didn't get to your question, but um, final one, where do you see the biggest and most common mistakes? Robert, this might be a good one for you. Um, most common mistakes. Um, I mean, probably the most common common mistake is is not signing up is is not signing up to to an agree to an agreement at all uh and it, it not being clear what terms are applying or having have, having inappropriate terms and not not really giving not really giving giving enough thought to, to what you're doing that's probably the most common mistake okay perfect um i think because we're running short on time i'm gonna end the questions there but thank you very much to you all listening um, and also a massive thank you to Rosemary and Robert for, for speaking for us today. Um, very much appreciated. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that we have recorded the webinar. So uh, we'll send out a link later today so you can watch it back or you can forward it to anyone that might have missed it. Um, and the slides will be on our website as well, the ACE website. And then final thing before I let you go is just a quick plug from me. Uh, next month, we have the ACE Emerging Professionals latest report. So this one's on future of the workplace. Uh, some details on screen now but we'll also send you some more information about the event um, after this so again thank you very much um, thank you to our speakers uh, thank you all for giving up your lunch time and uh, we'll speak to you next time thank you thank you thank you